Hello, I'm Clive Paget, and I'm the Features Editor for Musical America. In today's one-to-one, -one, I'm going to be talking to mezzo-soprano Dame Sarah Connolly. Born in County Durham in the United Kingdom, over a 30-year career, Sarah's become one of the most popular and successful singers of her generation. Her international career has seen her perform in opera houses and on concert stages around the world, from Covent Garden to the Met and Carnegie Hall. A vocal opponent of the British government's Brexit proposal, she's now deeply concerned with the plight of UK musicians and the ongoing campaign to agree visa-free travel arrangements for artists wishing to perform in the European Union. Hi, Sarah. Good to talk to you. Hi, Clive. Lovely to be here. I wanted to divide this interview into two sections, really. One, of course, to do with the pandemic, which has obviously affected everyone all across the globe, but uh, also something um, which I know has affected you particularly, which is the whole UK Brexit situation and where currently UK musicians find themselves um, at the moment. So let's start with the pandemic. I mean, how has it affected you personally? Well, many people have known because I've spoken about it very publicly. I've had uh, chemotherapy over the last year, so I've effectively been self-isolating anyway. Um, so the timing of it was pretty uh, fortuitous with that, with regards to that. Um, I wasn't earning any money six uh, four months prior to the COVID lockdown in February. This is the UK COVID lockdown. Um, so I it was just an, a ghastly extension of that. And so when my dear colleagues were saying, come March, February uh, and beyond, oh, my work's drying up, this is a disaster, I've got no money. And I just thought, well, I haven't had any since, <laughs> since, since October, uh, if not before September. Um, so I, I absolutely empathized with the panic that they were feeling. Um, and sadly are continuing to feel because there's still no light at the end of the COVID tunnel. So what do you see as the main challenges? Um, first, first of all, the main challenges for, for artists, for, for musicians um, going forward for the rest of 2021 and, and into the year after. The challenges artistically are going to be for directors to work out what is the best format for an opera production and which music they perform or a concert or an orchestra, uh, how many people they have on stage and um, what, who has been vaccinated in the room, what, <laughs> there's going to be an awful lot of logistics, there's going to have to be an awful lot of form filling and signing of things of when you've been looked at last, when was your last test, um, and there's going to be an awful lot of that going on before you even get to strike the bow you know or sing your first note there's going to be an awful, a whole different way of looking at hygiene and um regard for each other as to what many uh, theatre directors have been saying you know i'm not going to put on a production if my actors can't breathe in each other's faces um, i quite agree but you know, are you facing the fact that you're 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 cutting your the nose off your own company by saying something like that, or are you going to adapt your productions to have some distance? Which, you know, we've all worked with. Most opera singers have worked with David Alden in the past. A lot of his productions are all about distance, and 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 you can say what you need to say without breathing and you know, up into somebody's face. I'm not quite sure how you do a production of Romeo and Juliet like that, but but there are there are um, and, and we've all seen Robert Wilson productions where nobody looks at anybody anyway, and everyone's <laughs> staring straight out front. I'm not a I have to say personally, I'm not a fan of that kind of uh, staging, but that may be uh, something we're going to have to start thinking about for now until we've acquired her her immunity, and I think it's going to be two years. I'm just wondering what uh, your personal situation is with regards to your work diary. I mean, I'm assuming offers are coming in. Um, how do you respond to, uh, to to what people are asking you to do at the moment? Well, there have been no offers for any operas coming in beyond what's in the diary already, which some of which go through to 2024. I'm not saying it's full, but there are offers there. Those aren't being touched. Um, the concerts um, are being postponed up until May 
uh, in opera is being uh, postponed, if not cancelled, for the whole of this year. But there are offers coming in for recitals um, because those can be live streamed and there's only two of us on the stage and pianists are becoming dab hands at turning their own pages. So <laughs> it's sort of not, not an entirely desirable state to be in, but um, it seems to be something people want to listen to. It's not ideal, but they want to listen to live performances, um, whether they're streamed or even if there's just 50 people, it doesn't matter. It, it's, it's low income, but it is something. Can we talk a bit about the uh, the Brexit thing? Can I just ask, I mean, for the benefit of um, uh, of people in America who may not know what the situation was before and what the situation is now, what was basically the situation for um, for musicians in the UK as far as working in Europe was concerned before Brexit? Before Brexit, because Europeans were our neighbours, um, we were able to nip over to Europe with no visa, work visa um, arrangements. It was all gratis it was all expect it was all part of the the deal that we could hop on a plane after a phone call go to europe pay that pay our taxes in europe to the country where we were working um a percentage of those taxes and that would all be managed very simply and straightforwardly there would be no paperwork no red tape um all countries in, in the european union had signed up to this um and the majority of opera singers work is in Europe. Um, when we Brits come to America, um, we have to go to the American embassy and, and it's the same for you guys when you come here um, and all that rigmarole. But now we're expected to do that with the majority of countries in Europe, which means that we can't just nip over and do a stand-in replacement job for somebody who's gone sick or even um, for any long-term work there, say a second violin uh, job in a, in a French orchestra and vice versa. So currently then what, I mean, should, should you wish to go and sing in uh, at the Munich Opera House for a, for, um, on a two month contract, what, what would you have to do in order well, to do? Germany and France, bless them, are the two countries that are allowing Brits to come to Europe for 90 days without too much paperwork, a little bit, but nothing. I mean, it's extraordinary gift, really. Um, I get very angry when I see um, that not being acknowledged or by the government, but then why would they, you know? So, so, let's, so Spain is the problem. Right. Spain and Italy are the two countries at the moment that a lot of Brits work in Spain. I'm very lucky to be working in the Liceo next year, 2022. Um, and the, the list of things we have to sort out, we have to sort out, I mean, this is much more complex than an American visa where we don't have to provide our bank statements and how much we've earned uh, and show that we're not in, uh, have an overdraft <laughs> or that, or that we um, have to throw, show three years of taxes um, paid. Just to get an a just to get a work, work, in Spain. work visa in Spain. Um, and all sorts of other unbelievable things that you don't have to do to go and work in America. Wow. Um, and, and I just wonder what that's, what is that about? I, I have my suspicions, Gibraltar, but I don't actually know. So there are 27 countries in the European Union, isn't it, I think at the moment. I mean, do, do they all have different rules? And, yes. and are, are, therefore, musicians are expected to get their head around 27 different sets mm. of, uh, of regulations. And if they're touring, like with a rock band or even um, an orchestra or a choir, then uh, they have all these, and you know, with, with equipment, um, they have all sorts of problems with getting haulage uh, permits and driving permits, um, carnets. So there's, there's all sorts of issues with regards to larger groups. But my focus and what I'm focusing on is more the individual. That seems to have been not looked at by the government. They are more, they seem to be focusing their argument around pop groups. I mean, some people have been saying that Europe will effectively become a no-go zone for British musicians. I mean, do, do you think that's, if nothing changes, do you think that's um, a reasonable position? Um, 
I think there'll be many organizations that will try not to do that. Um, they don't want not to have British artists. There's, no, there's nothing, they haven't got anything against us, but it just might be that they can't afford to their end to, to uh, do the paperwork. They can't afford to hire somebody to do the extra paperwork. Why their question is why should they when they can just have a German singer? Um, why should they bother unless that particular artist is so interesting? <laughs> And let's face it, when you start out in your career, I wasn't interesting. I had a, something interesting, I suppose, at 24, when I started to work with Philippe Herweger in Belgium. I had something of interest, but I, if, if it was a very, um, it wasn't a wealthy organisation, uh, um, uh, Philippe Herweger's choir and orchestra. Um, and if it had cost them anything to get me out there, I think they'd have gone with another singer. So essentially what needs to happen here? What, what should happen next? Various people have been asking for a musician's pass. Uh, I think that's possibly worth pursuing. Um, and that who should that include? It should include everybody who's connected with the tour that's the managers, that's the, the, the people who drive the bus, that's the people who provide the music. That's, you know, whoever normally goes on a tour should be given this pass. And I'm not saying it should be free, free, totally free, but it should be hugely reduced and it should be reciprocal. As you understand it, are any, uh, are any artists or musicians actually involved in ongoing <laughs> negotiations in any way, shape or form? Um, it's quite difficult, I think, for musicians to get personally involved. Um, Simon Rattle tried for a bit, um, Alison Balsam and Sheku Kana Mason tried for a bit, but I think ultimately it's so sapping and so draining. Um, and it's difficult not to get emotionally upset when you see what they're trying to do, um, which is not to help musicians. They pay lip service to trying to help them, but how do you persuade them? writing letters to the Times signed by Elton John. It's a start, but until Elton John himself demands <laughs> a meeting with Boris Johnson some, somewhere public and it's filmed, um, I don't see that there's uh, Andrew Marr, for example, the, the uh, BBC journalist, maybe should invite Elton John onto his programme. Uh, I, I, he's a wonderful advocate, uh, so is uh, so. So many are. Um, Brian May is very eloquent. Why, why, why not invite him onto the program to ask him um, with Oliver Dowden, the culture secretary, or Caroline Dinenage, and ask them to answer directly on screen to the questions posed by these people. Sarah, that's um, that's incredibly uh, insightful and, and and real I am in many uh, many uh, ways. Um, thank you so much for talking to us uh, today about it all. You're welcome.